So double pipeline hash join is an interesting variant of a simple hash join. So here what you do is you keep two hash tables in main memory, one for input R, one for input S, and then you input into the hash tables and probe from those tuples without exhausting one of the inputs first. So in the simple hash join, we first inserted all elements from R into the hash table and then we probed everything from S against it. Here we do that concurrently. So why does this make sense? This makes sense in streaming environments. Assume that this is not a finite set of tuples, but this is kind of infinite, like in a streaming environment. Streaming environment. For example, sensors, sensor data. A simple example would be a temperature sensor measuring the temperature every minute and it would send the tuple, maybe join it against something else. There, in such a scenario, there's no end to the stream. So then you can't run the standard join algorithms because those algorithms assume that the sets are finite. So how does this double pipeline hash join work? So in the beginning, assume that both tables are empty and we start by drawing one of the input elements from input R. So this tuple is called R1. We draw it from R and then we probe it against the other hash table. Of course, this does not produce any result because the hash table is empty. So no join result is going to be produced, no output. However, after probing, we also insert this tuple into the hash table of R. That is what we do here. So we insert it here and now it sits in this hash table. Now we could draw, for example, an element from S. That's what we do here. We draw S1, we probe it against hash table R. So always against the other hash table we probe and the own hash table is used for inserting. We probe it and maybe they match and then we produce a join result. Already after drawing the second tuple. The first tuple was from R, now the second is from S. Now already we have this join result, possibly. Yeah? It doesn't have to be a match, but it could be potentially a join result. And of course, we insert it into the hash table belonging to S and so forth. So maybe here's a second tuple from R. Again, we probe against that hash table. Maybe we have a join result, maybe not. It doesn't have to match. It depends on whether this is returned by querying this hash table with this specific value. So it doesn't have to be a join result, of course, but it might potentially be. Again, we insert it and so forth. That is double pipeline hash join. So if you look at the pseudocode, we have a join predicate again as before, and we need a helper function. So this is used for both inputs. It always puts the tuple into the hash table belonging to the specific input and probes the other inputs. So if the input tuple is say from R, that's element of R, then we insert into R and probe S and vice versa. If it's element from S, we insert into S and probe Ah, of course, the order here doesn't matter. You can, whether you first insert and then probe or the other way around, it doesn't matter. That is what is done in the helper function. So here you see it. We probe this index here. We query the index with a specific key. So this is the join key, of course. We are talking about an equijoin. Then, so here we check whether that query result returned anything. Anyhow, only then we produce additional join results for this specific function call. So here we create this join result set produced for this specific tuple. That is again the tuple cross product, the query result set coming from the other side. Here we do the actual insert belonging to the hash table for this specific tuple. And then in any case, we return the join result set, even though it may be empty. So the actual join method, double pipeline hash join looks as follows. Again, both inputs are an S, then the join predicate. And then what we do is, as explained in the example above us, we create those two empty hash tables here, one for each input. And then we have here a flag that is determining the strategy, how to draw from the different inputs. Here, this is just alternating. I draw from R, then from S, R, S, always interchanging. But this can be any strategy. Just for simplicity, I use 
this alternating strategy in the pseudocode here. So then what I do is while those inputs have some data left, that is what this method is signaling has next means there's something to return. Then I decide based on this flag, if this flag is set to true, which is the case in the first iteration, this means this is true, so we read from R. That is where we draw from. So here I call this probe and insert helper method above and I use as input the next tuple in the input stream from R and I pass as parameters the hash table belonging to R and the index to probe, which is the other hash table in this case. That is what I'm probing to and that is what I explained here. And whatever is being returned here is then appended to the output. If it's an empty set, of course, I remove it. I can check that here was another if condition if I wanted, but didn't do that here for simplicity. So whatever's returned here by this probe and insert is appended to the output if, if it's not empty. And that is what happens here. So if you decide to draw from S and you do the opposite, then you pass the next element of S to this probe and insert method and the hash table belonging to that input S and this is a hash table to probe. So it's just basically swapping the roles, inverting the roles of the two indexes. And then here, that is the strategy I mentioned here, always change. This is just done here by flipping this bool value. So if I read from R in one round, I will negate it and therefore I will read from S in the next round. So you keep on looping over that. Eventually one of the inputs is exhausted, then this loop is left and then you still have to post process the remaining data. So here if S is empty and R still has some data, you have to run another loop where you do the same thing basically as above. In, in the case that R is empty and S has some data, you would jump over this one and then you go into this loop and you keep on drawing from S till S is exhausted as well. So after those two loops, both inputs must be exhausted. That is the general idea of double pipeline hash join. And I'd like to briefly explain the similarity to the simple hash join again, because it's really important to understand. So again, that is a general pattern, drawing from one, probing against the other. And the order again doesn't matter. We could also first insert it here and then probe it against the other. It does not matter. And I explained it using hash tables. However, the same algorithm again works perfectly fine for any index structure that is suitable for the accurate join. So it doesn't have to be a hash table. It could be a B-tree. It could be any index structure that allows you to get all the tuples from the other relation that have the same join key. That's the only thing that you require here. It doesn't have to be a hash table. It could even be an external memory structure. So no one forces you to run that in main memory. You could do that on disk if you wanted. So to generalize, we should really say this is a double pipeline index join. It could be any index. It's the same algorithm. Just replace hash table by index. This algorithm is going to work out of the box. And then the interesting question is, what is the relationship to index nested loop join? Relationship to index nested loop join. So if you are unsure about that, look at my video on index nested loop join before continuing here. So what is the difference? The difference is in index nested loop join, we do not draw alternately from the two inputs. Rather, we first build up one of the indexes that is called the build input. So we build up this index here. In simple hash join, this index is the hash table, but in the general, in the more general index nested loop join, we draw all the elements first from this input relation R. Whatever is available here, we input it into that index. That is what happens here. So here we really have a loop. We, we keep on looping here until all of this is exhausted. And then we have a big index here. So only when we are done inserting all the elements from R into this index R, we look at the second input S. That is what happens here. So here we draw the first element and we probe it against the other index. And that is what we keep on doing. Again, we loop over that. We keep on looping all of the elements, probing those elements. But of course, it doesn't make sense at all to build an index for 
s in this situation because the index on r will do all of the magic. No need to create a second index. So the second index is only required if you draw alternately from the two inputs. So the major difference of double pipeline hash join over index nested loops join. Keep in mind again, this join works for all kinds of indexes. No need to keep a hash table. Yes, you need to worry about performance, of course, because the structures you use in all of those index-based joins have a huge impact on performance. However, the major effect is in the standard index nested loop join or the simple hash join, which is a special case, you have a clear separation of the build and the probe phases. You first build one of the indexes up. If it already exists, you can just skip that step and directly probe it. And then in the second phase, you probe that index, which already existed before or was just built by this join algorithm. So here in double pipeline index join, as we call it a double pipeline index join, here you interleave those two phases. Therefore, you need two indexes, but therefore you can also operate on inputs that are unbounded and you can also produce join results quicker. Why quicker? That is maybe a final thought on that, quickly producing join results. So assume you have a graph like that. Here is time. Here I depict the number of join results. Okay, so what happens in the standard index nested loop join? So you keep on drawing from one of the inputs. You need to build up the index. That takes time. So you have a certain lag, a certain off time here. Let's call it off time where the index is built. Only after the index was entirely built, you keep on currying using data from the other inputs. So only then you get a graph like that. Yeah? Then you keep on producing joint results. That is the curve you get for index nested loop join. In contrast for double pipeline index join, you immediately start building up both of the indexes. And of course, the likelihood is very low that early on you produce many results, but there is some likelihood that you produce some result. So the curve you obtain for that join is something like this. That would be double pipeline index join. The absolute differences here depend a lot on the index structures, the size of the data sets being inserted, stuff like that. But basically you see here already you produce some of the results rather than having nothing. And typically there's some intersection point and maybe a little more above, maybe a little more below. It depends on the constants and the complexities of the index structures used in the join algorithms. But typically in all these methods that produce join results early on, rather than batching index creation and then running all of the other input against it, you have in terms of absolute times a longer time to run the join, a longer total time for join execution. And therefore there's a crossover between those two curves. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like button. Thank you. So if you want to see more database videos, be it in English or in German, take a look at my website datenbankenlernen.de. It has a couple of English and German videos. You can also subscribe to my YouTube channel Jens Did, or you look at our website infosys.uni-saarland.de. See you there!